Don Shalom. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. There's uh, two papers there for you to grab, David, as you walk in. Um, but good morning to those of us, those of you who are joining us online for uh, week three of our study in Revelation. Good evening to those that are in the same time zone. Yeah, good evening to everyone who's also here in person. You know, it's uh, I understand the weather and I'm not. The joy of technology is that you can join us in person or you can join us remotely. But those who braved the tundra, I had a great afternoon. I built snowmen. I went sledding. I, well, my daughter had a great afternoon. I had a cold afternoon. But it was fun, and so it, it worked out well. Um, I just heard the door open, so we're going to kind of stall for a minute. Welcome. There's two papers there, one of uh, the, the handouts for this week. So those of you who have joined us and have your papers, uh, those are the weekly handout and then the quotes from this week. As I said, I will give you a copy of all the quotes that I referenced throughout the class. Generally, I will actually quote them. I might not, but they're in my notes. So when I was making my notes, I said, I want this quote in there, so you have that. Um, if you're joining us online, the link should be in the comment section. It's the same link as every week, so if you just want to bookmark that puppy, you can save it. And then you should find these documents under the weekly handout folder. Um, and that's where you'll see week three quotes and week three uh, no, uh, weekly handout. But let's, let's pray, okay? Father God, we come before you, Lord. We thank you for today. We thank you to we have the opportunity to gather together. God, we thank you that we can study your word. We pray that you would reveal your heart to us, that you would make your presence known to us. God, as we, we seek understanding, right, and understanding of who you are, so we commit our time to you, that our hearts would be open to hear what you would speak, that we'd see and know your goodness, God. And we pray this in your holy, precious name. Amen. So, right, every week, our goal, you're going to get hear me, tired of hearing me say this. I'm sure Dale and Ned are very tired of it already. We have, like, two purposes. One, what does this passage tell us about the, like, the ways, the character, and the mission of God? Like, those are the things Pastor Ryan is talking about. Like, that's what we are trying to understand. Welcome. There's uh, two handouts for this week right there. But the scripture is supposed to reveal the ways, mission, and character of God. So let's understand the ways, mission, and character of God from the scriptures. Uh, the second is we want to understand what Paul says in 2 Timothy and ask, how is this text useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work, right? And even as we saw last week, right, blessed are the ones who read aloud the words of this prophecy and who do them, do the things, right? The scripture is to equip us, right, the... Uh, the how-tos for your ought-tos, as Pastor Kent would say. Like, there's the things we're supposed to do, and the Scripture tells us how or should guide us in how we do them. Uh, so we're in week three. Our text for this week will be Revelation chapter 1, verses 9 through 20. So we're picking up steam. Last week we did eight verses. This week we're doing 11 verses. Next week we're doing two chapters. And then we're slowing back down again. Um, but so Revelation chapter 1, 9 through 20 is what we're going to study um, as, uh, as with every week, if you have questions, Angela, there's handouts right there for you. Uh, feel free to ask questions. If you're viewing online and you have questions, comments, feel free to post them. I will do my best to respond to them this week. Maybe not tonight. I can't do them live and I can't promise tomorrow, but I'll try. Uh, last week, right? So if week one, we kind of outlined the fundamentals of the groups, right? So we have the, the preterists, the people who see all of the, the text of Revelation being fulfilled, within the first couple decades or centuries of Christian history, the historists who look at all of church history. Uh, so if they're in the 1500s, they see 1500 years of church history and they see how Revelation applied to those 1500 years. If they're in the 1900s, they see 1900 years of church history. And so they, they generally in different eras, people reevaluate uh, the interpretation of Revelation if they hold a historist view. There's the idealist, which talks about um, that Revelation doesn't talk about specific concrete events, but uh, spiritual realities that apply throughout history. And then the futurists who say these events, largely, specifically from chapter 4 on, deal exclusively with future events. Um, and then I, my presentation, or what, I, what you'll hear me uh, references, and you know, it can be all of them. We can, we can have it all. 
Um, and there, there's things that we can grasp about truth from all of them. Last week, we talked about the type of letter it was. So last week, the prologue to the letter uh, was, was, we said that it's an apocalypse, a revelation, and we, we defined that and talked about its factors and its facets. Uh, a prophecy, we said prophecies are not primarily predicting the future, but speaking the, the inspired word of God, um, often to a, to a specific audience with a specific message and purpose. And then a letter, meaning that it was sent to real people in real time, so it had to have real meaning to them. Um, and I have much fuller definitions of all of those in your reference docs if you want them. Uh, so last week, we, we learned mostly whose revelation this is. We t it, it's the, the identification that this is like the revelation that John is writing that was revealed to him by an angel who was sent by Jesus, who got it from the Father, right, through the Holy Spirit, right? So that it is God's revelation. And we talked about um, like uh, uh, the first of the blessings, like blessed are you who reads this. We see God the Father speak for the first time in Revelation 1, and he will speak again for the, the last time in Revelation 22. Those are the only two times the Father speaks. And God the Father identifies himself as the Alpha, the Omega. We talked about um, him who is, his existence now, who was, his existence from eternity past, and who is coming, his active reality in time and in the future. And so this week... We are getting to the opening scene of Revelation, right? Uh, if you imagine like old time movies, they started out with the credits at the beginning. They told you who the actors were. They told you who the director was, whose story it was. Revelation is the same way. The first eight verses tell us where this came from, who the author is and, and all of that. And now this is the opening scene of the book. And that's probably to me the best way to view it because it sets the tone for everything else. So uh, imagine your favorite movie, and I'm going to give us two examples, and, and, and think of the opening scene. What does the director of that movie want you to want to show you that catches you, that tells you what the rest of the movie is going to be about? So for instance, if you've seen It's a Wonderful Life for our older generation, because I have a more modern example too. But the opening scene, you hear all the prayers and people are like, help George Bailey, help daddy. All right, so we know there's a guy named George. We know he's in trouble. They're praying to God. And then the opening, you see then in heaven in the stars, God and Joseph and Clarence, the angels. And they're all talking about like, man, George is in trouble. He's going to hurt himself. We got to do something. He's had a good life and he's lost sight of that. And that sets the tone for the whole movie. You know what the movie is about. It is about George, his life, and why he should not kill himself. That tells you. So from, from those opening lines, we know what the whole movie is going to be. So another great example is The Dark Knight. If you've seen The Dark Knight, it's the second one of, uh, of Christopher Nolan's Batman movies. It starts out with Joker's bank robbery. We've never met Joker yet, but we see this elaborate bank robbery and Joker finally revealing himself. And he says, like, and his, the first line he really says is like, like, whatever doesn't kill you simply makes you stranger. And it introduces the villain to the movie and it sets the tone for who Batman is going to fight in the whole movie. So this opening scene sets the tone for the rest of the text. And everything else in the text, we know who the author is, we know the opening scene of it, and everything else is viewed through the lens of the opening scene. Just like we view the whole Bible through the opening reality of God created everything. Yes. Like, imagine trying to read the Bible without paying attention to Genesis 1. Like, we're in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Like, there was nothing and God formed it. The, the, the doctrine of God creating everything ex nihilo, out of nothing, is the, the, the foundation for why he's God. Yeah. And so that sets the tone for all of the Bible. And so just, um, just like that, the, the opening scene of Revelation tells us how we should view all of Revelation. So I'm going to read the, uh, the verse, verses 9 through 20, and then we're going to dig through it. Uh, I'm going to read out of the English Standard Version, but you may also have a wonderful version, which will sound similar. So uh, Revelation chapter 1, verse 9. I, John, your brother and partner in tribulation and the kingdom and the impatient endurance that is in Jesus, was on an island called Patmos, on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. 
I was in the spirit on the Lord's day when I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamum and to Thyatira and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. And on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash across his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were burnished bronze, refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held the seven stars, and from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. When I saw him, I fell, on his, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last, the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore. I have the keys of death and Hades. Write, therefore, all the things that you have seen, those that are, those that are about to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So, there's so much to talk about here and I'm excited. So we're going to just start, right? We're going to go verse by verse. Verse 9, um, John reiterates that he is the writer. Don't know which John, but it is John. And he, who he's writing to, he is, uh, well, no, no. And he says, I, John, your brother and partner and tribulation and the kingdom. So, so John identifies kinship with the churches. He's not some sage sitting on a tower writing a note to the, the peons down below. He is their brother. There is an intimacy here, especially Ephesus. Ephesus is where John's ministry, assuming that this is John the Apostle, right? Uh, Ephesus is strongly linked to John the Apostle's ministry. Um, and he's not just their brother, but he is their partner, right? He is paired alongside them in tribulation and the work of the kingdom, right? If you remember week one, I said the word tribulation only appears five times in this book. One time it appears here, right? The tribulation that is talked about the first time is the present suffering reality that these churches are facing. The world they're in. And John understands it. So John, everything John is about to write is written from a place of understanding, just as Jesus walked on the earth and understood the reality of human living, John understands that which, he is, that which God is calling the church to do through John. Right? Remember, the main point, the main lesson of this book is the question is, will the church worship the Lamb by remaining faithful and bearing faithful witness to the victory that God has won? Or will we worship the power of this world? That is the question. And John is here about to give a message uh, to some churches of encouragement, to others of challenge, and to others of stern rebuke. And he is partnering along them. It, he is someone who has been there, has been in the, 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 the grit of it. He's not someone sitting on a throne saying, hey, why are, you know, he's not like a... Uh, this isn't like, you know, the undercover boss is like, you CEOs don't understand what it's like to be a line worker in their company. Like, this isn't that, where like someone's up in their penthouse office that doesn't understand what it's like to be the line worker. John is here. He's in the midst of it. And, and he is their partner not only in tribulation, but also in the work of the kingdom, both of which are in Jesus, right? We can't, like, so we'll, we'll talk about that in a second, right? Um, I've talked a ton this past year about the intersection of the work of the kingdom and tribulation, right? The closing of the Beatitudes is after blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are all of these people, and then the culmination of is blessed are those who are persecuted. We talked about how literally everybody but John the Apostle, like mentioned in the Bible, was executed for their faith. Like we talk so much, and we'll see it in the next couple chapters, about the reality of the persecution that these people were facing, the tribulation, the cost of discipleship, which is most famously attributed to Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the, the church pastor who 
um, led the underground church in Germany during the Nazi occupation. And John is saying like the, the, the kingdom work and tribulation are inevitably partnered because the kingdom of God is inevitably going to be in conflict with the kingdom of this world. No matter how perfect, even if every world leader everywhere became a born-again, spirit-filled Christian, it is still going to be a work of humanity, which means it will fall short of the kingdom of God, which means at some place there will be conflict between the two. And so John is identifying partnership in that, but he is also identifying as a partner in patient endurance, which is in Jesus. Jesus' endurance is referenced many times throughout the apostle, right? For the joy who was set before him, he endured the cross, is what Hebrews talks about. Endurance is about, like, is about the, the, the ability to endure through the kingdom work and through the tribulation is about our ability to, to like make it through, not get out of it, not be pulled out of it, not to go around it, but to, to, to remain faithful in our witness in spite of it and make it to the other side. And ultimately, the other side is the throne room of heaven. Right? Making it through the other side may lead to your death. For Stephen it did, but he saw the Son of Man seated at the right hand of God in the throne room of heaven. Um, so just as Jesus endured the cross and the tribulation of life while remaining faithful in his witness to the kingdom of God, John is an equal partner in calling the churches, the seven churches of Asia and the greater church as a whole, to that same ministry. Already there, one verse. We just talked a bunch. Not even a whole verse. He was on an isle called Patmos. Um, so this is an island about 50 miles from Ephesus. It's in the Mediterranean. Um, we talk about him being in exile there, but what we have to understand about exile in the Roman Empire is that it's not likely that he was chained in a prison. It's that he was sent to this island that is remote, away from people you know you know if sometimes at your work there's like that office that's out of the way we just don't want to deal with you so we're going to put you in the, the the annex building so we don't have to interact with you it'd be like if we didn't want to talk to pastor dale anymore and so we put his office in the basement of the manor house while we're over here doing real work and he's like dale you got to go work out of the manor house tomorrow and yeah. so yes and <laughs> like so so john is sent to a more remote part of the 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 empire he can't go anywhere. He's stuck on this island, but he's, he's probably just living a normal life on this island. Um, or like a normal life on this island. There's, there's a lot of information about the Isle of Patmos. Um, one of the things is that it's never identified as a prison colony. There are prison colonies, so it's not like that he's on a chain gang on this island. It is more likely that he's just there where he has very limited contact with the outside world. He can maybe send letters by boat. Maybe he has no communication, but he can't go on an evangelistic crusade or something like that. Um, it's interesting. He says, right, it says there that, uh, that, that, that I, John, was on the isle called Patmos on account of the work of the Lord, right? He's there because of his faithful witness to God, which builds into like, I'm the brother in this tribulation. Uh, but what that tells us is that John received the visions while on the Isle of Patmos. That does not mean he wrote the book of Revelation while on the Isle of Patmos. Uh, one of the leading theories is that John uh, received the vision on Patmos, but then after... Uh, well, so actually, we're going to talk about a little Greek here. That word I was is the aorist tense in Greek, which indicates a complete action. Um, early church records indicate that John's exile on Patmos ended and that he returned to Ephesus, which is where he had started his ministry. Well, I guess where much of his ministry had been. It's where we, this is, so all of this is assuming John the Apostle wrote this. Um, that uh, John the Apostle wrote the book of John and the, the letters of John from Ephesus, um, and that he returned there. And generally, the way that timeline would work is that um, John had been exiled there under Domitian. 
which if we remember all the way back to the first week, Domitian is the later date for Nero is the earlier date. Domitian is the later date. And then when Domitian died, his, his precursor, or his succeeder, not his precursor, um, his successor, which I don't, um, oh, Nerva. Nerva is the emperor who comes after Domitian. And we have Roman records that say that Nerva recalled all of Domitian's exiles. So everyone that Domitian had exiled get a pardon from Nerva and they're all allowed to come home. Um, so the, the, generally the, the in, well, and a leading interpretation, I don't want to say that it's the majority or most, but a leading interpretation is John receives this vision on Patmos. And then when he is recalled from Patmos, he goes back to Ephesus and writes the vision there. Um, and the other thing we have to think about is that this is a vision. John does not talk about how he's going through this vision taking notes. He has the whole vision, and then he starts to write it down. It may have been days, weeks, months. We have no idea how if this is one long vision or multiple visions. We don't know if how long this vision took, if it was a seven-hour vision, and then he has to relay it and write it down. So there's a time elapse that likely takes place from when John receives the vision to when he writes it down, which is the same thing that like Ruthie talked about right this morning. Like God spoke something to me. All right, what'd he say? Well, I can't quite remember. All right, carry a notebook and write it down. Like John's not going through this vision quest with a notebook writing stuff down. They didn't have notebooks back then. So what that tells us is John has some time to organize what he writes, to process what he writes, to digest what he is writing. Like, so when he talks about, I saw, he has an opportunity to pick the words he chooses to describe what he sees, right? He could just say, I saw someone with white hair, but he doesn't. He says, I saw someone who had hair that was white as wool. And that is a very specific word choice that has very specific meaning that could have easily been conveyed with other words, but John has time and opportunity to pick those specific words that matter. John is writing what he sees, and he is guided by the Holy Spirit through this whole process, right? So, where was I? And so he's on the Isle of Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus, and we will see this parallel throughout, this pairing throughout. The word and the testimony, the word and the witness, those go together. Like the word of God is literally the testimony of who God is. And so for us, carrying out the word of God or teaching the word of God, like is our witness to the truth of the word of God. And we will see that like, um, that, that this pairing of word and witness will appear throughout the book because they are inseparable. What are we bearing faithful testimony to, to the word of God? So it's verse nine, it only took us 24 minutes. Um, verse 10, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. So John is in the spirit. This is the first of four times, um, that, that John mentions being in the spirit. Interestingly enough, the other three times that we will see this statement, I was in the spirit, they involve an angelic invitation. An angel meets him and invites him often to go somewhere with John, to go on this journey. We mentioned last week that apocalypse and apocalyptic literature have angel messengers in them. And so in this first instance, we hear, I was in the spirit and we see his inaugural vision, the opening scene, the first thing John sees. And then as we hear about John being in the spirit later, it is an angel coming and saying, come with me, let's see this thing. He hears uh, a voice that is loud like a trumpet. I don't know exactly why that is. Like I, it's a loud voice, like blaring. Um, and, and as I said, right, we will often see this shown throughout the book. First, John hears something. Then John sees something. What John sees is a description of what John hears. So he hears this voice. And, and then in a, and the voice is saying, verse 11, write down, let me see, I lost my spot. Write down what you see in a book. And send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamum, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. 
This is the first time John is commanded to write. We will 12, 11 more times, a total of 12 times in the book of Revelation, John is commanded to write down what he sees. And he reiterates that John is not the source of this information. He is writing down a divine vision from God, right? He is expressing what God has revealed to him. So he writes 12, to, 12 times he's told to write to the seven churches, right? We talked about how those numbers are super important. 12 is often associated with the tribes of Israel and the people of God. Seven is the number of completeness and, and of wholeness and perfection. So like John is writing this message to the totality of the church, the, the full church of all time for this message that God has for him. And it comes from God. And this is the second time that the seven churches are mentioned, and they are listed at this point. As I mentioned last week, we know that there are three other churches that exist in Asia at this time. Asia being the Roman province of Asia, which is modern-day Turkey. We know that there is a church at Colossae. We know that there is a church at Hierapolis and at Troas. Paul founded maybe all three of those. Uh, Hierapolis and Troas are mentioned in the book of Acts. Colossia, Colossae got the book of Colossians. So we know that there are churches in existence in Asia. And so when, when God says the seven churches of Asia, well, it's, well, which seven? There's actually 10. It's because it's, the implication is that this is for the whole church. It's for all. That seven is a symbolic number. It's literal that there are seven churches being written to. But it is chosen only those seven not because those other churches aren't relevant, but because seven is indicative of the completeness of this message for the whole church. And he lists them all. Um, the, uh, the order that they are mentioned uh, would seem to indicate that the letter would first go to Ephesus, the most important church in Asia at the time, and one of the most important churches in the Roman Empire. And so if you're in like Ephesus, which is here, and you were to kind of make a little loop like that, that's how the churches would go. So if you follow this list, if you were to plot them out in order, it's kind of like you start here at Ephesus, you make a little journey like a backwards C, and you end up kind of right back there at Laodicea. Um, and so this would be a normal route that a messenger would take. So even their ordering matters because it is, they're not... We would say, well, why aren't they alphabetized? You should alphabetically list things. Well, back then, they didn't care about alphabetically listing things. Also, maybe they are alphabetic in Greek. I don't know. I did not look that up, but I don't think they're alphabetic in Greek. It is more the route that this letter carrier, this messenger who is bringing this around. They don't have email. They don't have post offices. Someone is carrying this all the way to all these churches. To make the whole loop, I did not look that up. I'm going to shotgun from the hip that it's a, it's a couple hundred miles, probably. Um, like modern-day Turkey, I don't know exactly how big modern-day Turkey is. These are mostly in western Turkey. Um, but I'm going to guess that western Turkey is about the size of Ohio. So it would be like, I don't know, you started in Dayton. You made a route up to Toledo, Cleveland, Youngstown, I guess like Zanesville, uh, Chillicothe, and then you ended up over in like Mason. I don't know. That's, I, and if you don't know where any of those cities are, I mean, it's okay. Uh, that was off the cusp. I could be super wrong. Turkey may be huge. It may be the size of Texas. I don't know. Um, but what, I, what little I do know of geography, I'm going to guess that that's about what it is. So a couple hundred miles, I guess. It's like, a, 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 like your average person can journey about 50 miles a day. That's a day's journey on a horse. Like 25 miles a day walking is like a general journey. So this is like a multi-week journey to make it all the way around. So anyways, verse 12. So write the letter to these seven churches. Verse 12. Then I turned, right? So John hears a voice. Write this down. And it's loud. It's booming. And he turns around. So hearing the voice is like inspires curiosity. He wants to know what he is, who it is that's talking to him. And... Then I turned around to see the voice that was speaking, and on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands. So, the very first vision in all of Revelation is of lampstands. It's not of plagues, not of fire, not of damnation. It's not even of the throne room. It is seven lampstands. 
And in the midst of the lampstand, one who is like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash across his chest. We want to be cautious about like trying to separate out verses. Verses weren't added to the Bible until the 1700s. So John didn't write these verse numbers in there. Like those were added much, much later. So, but the first thing that John sees are the seven lampstands and the son of man in the midst of the lampstands. The vision which we are supposed to read all of Revelation is the presence of Jesus Christ in the midst of his churches. As you'll see later in verse 20, the seven lampstands are the seven churches. This is Jesus' presence in the midst of the churches. It's not him looking at the churches. It's not him like lording over them. It is God's presence in the midst of the churches. And as we're about to write all of the things in the chapters two and three to these seven churches, like the circumstances, like Jesus says, like, I see this, I know your, and it's because he is in the midst of them. So the, the, the golden lamps, well, okay, I got to slow down. Whew. So like that is the lens. The lens that we read all of Revelation is God's presence in the midst of his churches. It is the opening scene that sets the tone for the whole book. And it is, it's a book end, right? It, like if you think of like bookends, like two things that hold a stack of books together. We just rearranged all our books in our house. And so like we have a bunch of bookends that keep them from falling over. On the beginning of the book, it's this vision of Jesus' presence among the churches in the lampstands. And if you jump all the way to Revelation 22, like the last thing John sees before he closes his letter out and says, Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Right? The final vision is of the garden city of the new creation and God and the Lamb in the midst of the garden city with their people. The beginning of the story is Jesus and his presence in the midst of the churches. And the end of the story is that God and Jesus are in the presence in the midst of their churches in the new creation. That is the point of Revelation. And everything we read is about that. That's not to say that there aren't visions of plagues and judgment and all of that. But all of those need to be viewed through Jesus is in the midst of his churches and sees their circumstances. And more than that, so now let's talk about the golden lampstands. So um, there are seven of them. The pastor, and we'll see them again later in this. I want to actually make sure because I think I, t I might talk about them later in this. Uh, no, we'll talk about the golden lampstands later in verse 20. The point is, is that verse 20 tells us they are the church. The golden lamp stands and Jesus is in the midst of the church. And, and he is described as one who is uh, like a son of man. Son of man. Um, outside of the book of Ezekiel, son of man is a term exclusively used to describe Jesus. So uh, the son of man has come to seek and save the lost, like through, especially, I think Matthew is the one who most often uses the term son of man, but I could be wrong. Uh, in the gospels, we hear it, uh, and most notably in the book of Daniel. So this is, I said, we're going to try and stay in Revelation, but this is super important, right? John is describing what he sees using terms that are theologically charged, terms that have weight to the audience that is reading them. And so let's talk about the description of the Son of Man, right? Uh, uh, Wait a minute. Gotta... Yeah. Why does it say like the Son of Man? So because that's the, I guess, the terminology to describe. It, uh, when, when people see the, the only time like Jesus is described as the Son of Man is like in the Gospels and in the rest of them, in Daniel, in the vision, when Stephen uh, sees the, the, this like, like the Son of Man, it's, it's described as like a Son of Man. I don't know why the prophets describe it that way, but Daniel uses the same terminology. Uh, that shouldn't <coughs> change our understanding that it's Jesus. Like Jesus is the son of man. Okay. Um, and not like, that's not a biological, like he is biologically a son of humanity, like of a person, but like the title son of man um, is attributed to who we now understand to be Jesus, the Messiah uh, in the book of Daniel. Um, I think that's probably the, earliest example. Maybe Isaiah has some too, but Daniel's the one we're going to focus on. But before we get there, right, so let's actually read 14 through 16 because it's going to, well, 13 through 16. Um, he's clothed with a long white robe. Clothes, right? Um, 
Oh, with a golden sash across his chest. That's important, right? Hairs on his head were like white, like wool. We see that his eyes are like flames of fire. His feet are like burnished bronze. Uh, we we uh, hear that his voice, I don't have that listed on here, is like a, a, a roaring of many waters. In his hands, I also don't have that listed on here, he's holding seven stars and the seven lamps, or seven stands. Um, well, no, in his right hand, he's holding seven stars, excuse me. And out of his mouth comes the sharp two-edged sword, and his face is shining like the sun in full strength. I don't know if you've ever tried to look directly into the sun. I know when the, when the, the eclipse happened, they said, don't look directly in the sun. And I did, and I, that hurt. Like, you can burn your eyes. But John is describing that that's what it is, and, and um, which even brings us back, well, okay, got to work through this. We don't want to start with the last description. Let's start with that. He's wearing a golden band, right? This represents uh, like someone who is of high rank, who has authority. His hair is, is white like wool, which means it's probably curly. You know, uh, you know the pictures of white Jesus with flowing brown locks? That is not probably how he looked in real life. Uh, if you want to know what Jesus probably looked like in real life, Google a picture of someone from the Middle East, and that's probably what he looked like. But if his hair is white like wool, wool is curly, right? It's coarse. It's rough. Sometimes it might be soft sometimes, but... Like, it's not just these flowing, beautiful locks like he's some Viking god, right? <laughs> right? And he's not Thor up there. He's got white hair. But every picture we have of him is this, like, I don't know, this guy conditions or something. But, like, <laughs> that's, that's, that's probably not what happened, guys. Well, what was kind of too? Yeah. He might have a little bit of a fro, man. <laughs> a wh <laughs> white like wool. But like white hair is a sign of age and honor um, and possibly wisdom. We see that throughout the Old Testament. You know, people want to dye their hair, but the Bible says like, like white hair is a sign of honor and we should, we should honor those. So, you know, not saying that dyeing your hair isn't biblical, but I'm also saying gray hair is a sign of, it should be something to respect according to scripture. Amen. That's right. Eyes like flames of fire, right? It is his eyes... Like, it's not like he's not like Cyclops blasting laser beams out of his eyes. It is a refining and a piercing gaze. It is something that can see deep into things. Like the eyes of God pierce into your soul. He has feet like burnished bronze refined in fire. Like, like it's hardened metal. We don't really, I don't know if I could describe some of you this probably bronze that you've seen. Like bronze is kind of like a caramel colored metal. Um, and if it's been burnished and like, it means it's like a, it's got a gleam to it. yeah, kind of like a gleam. Like maybe if you're like trendy and you went to like a hardware store recently, like they have silver, they have black and they have burnished metal. Like that's the other option. We just did most of my house in that, but it's kind of like the gleam to it. Um, but so that the, 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 the image of his feet describes, uh, as we will see later of his ability to judge as he will tread the wine press of his wrath with his burnished bronze feet. He is the good and just judge. We hear his voice, which was previously described as a trumpet, now being described like many waters. Um, and all that is meant to show like the, the power of the voice that comes with God. Like it's, it is, I don't know why those images were specifically chosen, right? Well, it's, it, there's so much about them. It is overwhelming. I don't know if you've ever stood near waterfalls. Like real waterfalls, like Brandywine Falls maybe, but I mean like a real waterfall. It is deafening. You can't hear anything. It is overwhelming. The voice of God is so loud that nothing else can be heard over top of it, right? If only we'd have ears to hear it, right? We'll get to that tomorrow. Yeah, if you're standing at the ocean trying to talk to the person next to you and the waves are everywhere, you're like, what? Yeah, try and talk over Niagara Falls. So this description is very similar to, to two chapters, Daniel 10 and Daniel 7. Um, so the, in Daniel chapter 10, I'll read it to you, you don't need to turn there. Um, the Son of Man is described as this, Behold, I lifted up my eyes and looked and beheld a man clothed with linen with a belt of fine gold from Uphaz around his waist. His body was like barrel, his face was like the appearance of lightning, his f eyes were flaming torches, his arms and legs uh, like the gleam of burnished bronze, and the sound of his words like the sound of a multitude. That's Daniel chapter 10, verse 5. But interesting, so in that we see um, he's got a belt, 
However, in Daniel chapter 10, the belt's around his waist, whereas here it's across his chest. I don't know why. He just has it in a different spot now. I don't know. Uh, we can't find a good explanation as to why that is. But here we also see that he's got like a face like lightning that is bright. It's shining. Um, eyes like flaming torches. Like we hear his feet being like bronze and his voice being loud. However, we also get Daniel chapter 7 verse 9. And so Daniel chapter 7 verse 9 says this. Sorry, my iPad changed directions. And I looked, as I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and his hair of his head was pure was like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames, its wheels were with burning fire. Very good. So pure wool being like an unblemished lamb. But what we see here is that the description of the Son of Man from Revelation draws on both the descriptions of the Son of Man and the Ancient of Days from Daniel. So the Son of Man being Jesus and the Ancient of Days being the Father. So this is where we've, this is so cool. Is this where I'm going to talk about it? So yeah, uh, I don't know. I'm going to in a second. So here Jesus and the Son of Man are described with characteristics that are found in Old Testament descriptions of both the coming Messiah and the eternal God Yahweh, the Ancient of Days. And, and we take a lot for granted about the Trinity, right? I need us to understand that, first off, the word Trinity doesn't appear in the Bible. The, the, it just doesn't. You will never find it in the Bible. It's not there. The... The, the theology and the statements that have helped us develop the, con the, the doctrinal position of the Trinity do exist. And Revelation is probably the most profound description of the Trinity consistently and of Trinitarian theology in the entire Bible. Like, I know we like to talk about Jesus being baptized and the voice of God and the dove coming down. Like, that's the picture of the Trinity. Guys, Revelation has so much more of it. And, like, it took, it was not until, uh, so, so a guy named Tertullian writing about 200 AD is really the first person in church history that we have record of that, that defines the doctrine of the Trinity as we understand it today. It wasn't until the Council of Nicaea in 350 that we get the, the creedal statements about the Trinity. Uh, if you took my, uh, if you if you paid, if you were here for the class we taught on the sixteen fundamental truths, the first week we talked about dogma. You have three different church councils, and their sole job is to define the nature of the Trinity because trying to understand how Father, Son, and Spirit are all God was complicated. And we just say, oh, they're one God in three persons. Guys, that concept split the church yeah. multiple times. Yeah. Like that was something that took. Godly, spirit-filled men and women a long time to be able to describe how they are like one God in three persons or one being in three persons, right? Three per one, uh, it's the same essence, uh, one substance, different essences, I think is the terms for it. The Greek words are usia and homoousia. So, like, and I'm not here to give you a lesson on church history. The point is, is that we cannot overlook the significance of Trinitarian statements, in the book of Revelation because it's these texts that became the foundation for like the core doctrine of all of Christianity, which is that one God in three persons. And so here, Jesus being described in terms that are associated with the Father identify their sameness, right? That Jesus isn't just the begotten Son, but he is also like God co-equal alongside the Father. And we're going to look at a lot of these as we go through, but like, it's just so important that you're going to get tired of me saying, that's a Trinitarian statement. You're like, yes, Chris, we know about the Trinity. Yeah, but for like 300 years, the church really didn't have a solid concept of it. And in fact, there's Pentecostals today. There's a whole denomination of Pentecostals that are not Trinitarian. They are called Oneness Pentecostals. Well, we don't need to go down that road. <laughs> it's there. They're very real. Um, and I know people who, who grew up in that. I know people who are in that right now. Um, 
I have friends of mine who struggled with it, like as they were Pentecost, or as they were like Trinitarian, and then they became oneness, and then now they're back, and like. But that's we're not. I'm not here to talk about that. The point is, is that like the concept of the Trinity is like, it's simple to us, and we use the words flippantly, like oh, just one God in three persons. It's so simple. Jesus, 100% God, 100% man, makes total sense. And then like we just kind of brush that off. But like those statements are. They're, they're simple to us because we have 1,800 years of church history in which that has been taught to us, but someone had to figure that out. It's like mathematics. We can say 1 plus 1 equals 2, but someone had to come up with the concept of 1 and then addition and then 2, and until they've resolved all that, like someone had to work super hard to get there. So, so Jesus being described in terms of the Ancient of Days is so critical. Um, Right here, in, in the first 20 verses of Revelation, we see profound realization of who God is. The message is coming from the Father, from the Son, and from the Holy Spirit. We have God speaking things about who He is. I am the Almighty, who is, who was, who is to come, or and who is coming, right? I am the Alpha and the Omega. And, and then we will see those similar statements describe Jesus throughout, and we will see the presence of the Holy Spirit and the rule, role of the Holy Spirit in here. The reason these themes are chosen is to establish the unity of the Godhead. So, okay, he's described. He also has in his hand seven stars. And from his mouth comes a two-edged sword, right? That doesn't mean he's got like a tongue for uh, like his sword and it's his tongue. It's that the words of his mouth, all right? And so that visual image of Jesus having a sword coming out of his mouth that is two-edged is a description of the, the word that comes from him, right? The word is sharper than a two-edged sword. It is about God's creative power, what the, the, the power of his words themselves, and that's what it is symbolic or representative of. If we go to heaven, I don't know if God's going to have a big old broadsword hanging out of his mouth. Like the description is meant to convey the power of the word that comes from Jesus, that the word of God and the word of Jesus are equal. That God's word, which is sharper than a two-edged sword that pierces, is the same as the word of Jesus, the Son of Man, who is also the ancient, who is who is linked inextricably to the ancient of days, and his face is shining like the sun. We saw Moses after he leaves his time on Sinai reflects God's presence on his face that everyone's like, cover your face. We can't see, we can't even look upon the reflection of God in your face. And Jesus here is giving a greater example. John is seeing a wild vision. This is wild and this is the lens. This is who is in the midst of the church. The God who has eyes that pierce, whose voice is 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 cannot be overcome his voice his words that are piercing uh, who has the, the ability to judge justly who is deserving of honor and glory like all of these are who is in the midst of the church so it's not just jesus in the midst of the church it is jesus who has all of these attributes in the midst of the church oh man all right 17 and 18 so when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead, but he laid his hand, right hand on me saying, fear not, I am the first of the last and the living one. I died and beheld, I live forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. So John's first response, he hears the command, and, he, and, and his response to hearing the command is to turn and see. He sees Jesus, and his first response is what? To worship, right? John's first response to the revelation of God right, to the apocalypse of Jesus, the revealing of who God is, is to worship him, right? The whole point of the book is, will we faithfully witness and bear faithful witness to God through worship? Will we worship through bearing faithful witness, like, and, uh, or will we worship the world? And John's response, I see the Son of Man and I will worship. The call to worship and bear faithful witness. And I would challenge people to remember, and myself, what I was like right after I received Christ as my yeah. Savior. Yeah. And Pastor Dale says, like, it's a, a challenge. It's like, what, what were we like when, right after we received Christ as our Savior? So John looks on the face of the resurrected Christ, and his assumption is that he's dead. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I'm dead. I, first off, and apparently he's got some fear because the first words that Jesus speaks to John after John realizes who is talking to him, is fear not. 
he hears a command, and when he turns and looks and sees that it is the resurrected Jesus, it is fear not. But we'll get, well, I want to, we'll get there. We're not there yet. I want to, well, no, we are. Right? So, if you've ever, actually, so a great example, if you go to Matthew chapter 1, um, well, no, not Matthew chapter 1. If you go to Luke chapter 1, when Zacharias sees the angel of the Lord in the temple, the first thing they say is, fear not. When Mary receives Gabriel, the response is, fear not. Uh, when the angels come to the shepherds, the response is, fear not. Something about encountering the divine spirit, the response of humans is fear, and the, and the comfort is, hey, you don't need to be afraid. John might be like, guys, sir, this is literally the most scary thing I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> and there's like, it's okay, man. You don't need to be afraid. Fear not. Absolutely. Is God expressing his amazing love to us? Go ahead, Pastor Dell. You don't need to apologize. Um, I think two more things are important is God placed his right hand. We're going to get to that. Yeah. So, the first thing, before he says that, he takes his right hand and places it on John. Now, what... What was the last thing we heard about that right hand? It was holding seven stars in it. Like this same hand that holds the cosmos together, right? That are the seven spirits of the churches that we'll see identified later. That are in God's hand is also gently put on God's, on John's shoulder. We can't separate those two realities. One verse before, John sees those stars and then now it's... Like the, the, the God of the universe, we talk about how like you can fit all of the galaxies in the palm of his hand and like that galaxy holding palm comes and sets on his shoulder. Two quotes, right? First comes from reading Revelation responsibly. It says, first, we have a sign of security. The all-powerful one will protect the church. Do not be afraid is a word not just to John, but to all who read and hear these words. They will be kept safe no matter what comes, and they will share in Jesus' conquest and his victory. Next, from the New American Commentary on Revelation, it says, With the same right hand, which only a moment before cradled the seven stars, the Son of Man gently touches John and assures him that there is no need for fear. Fear is unnecessary because of the identity of the Son of Man. He precedes all, he follows all, he lives after having died, and now lives eternally. In addition, he holds the remedy for death and for the grave. Right? The command is fear not. I got you. And then he explains why we don't need to be afraid. Why don't we need to be afraid? Right? First, I am the first and the last. Last week, we talked about how God the Father, speaking from the throne, identifies as the Alpha and the Omega. We will see that here... There are this concept of beginning and end is described in three different ways throughout Revelation. And in total, there are seven descriptions. First and last, beginning and the end, Alpha and the Omega. In, John, in, in Revelation 1, we have God the Father describing himself as Alpha the Omega, Jesus as the first and the last. Later, we will see God describe himself as Alpha and the Omega, beginning and the end. And then we will see Jesus finally in Revelation 20, I think, call himself the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. These are the same statement or the same spiritual explanation. God calling himself the Alpha and the Omega and the Father calling himself Alpha and the Omega and Jesus calling himself first and the last is the exact same claim. And as we see, they will overlap over each other with ultimately Jesus asserting to be the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end, to be the same thing that God the Father has claimed about himself. So that's a very profound Trinitarian reality, and you have to follow this pattern. And seven times this phrase, whether it is first and last, beginning and the end, Alpha and the Omega, appears in this text. This claim of being that which precedes all and that which extends beyond all occurs in totality, in seven times. Um, this name comes from Isaiah. Uh, Isaiah 44, 6 says this, Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me there is no God. That's Isaiah 44, 6. 
So right now, just by claiming it, Jesus is asserting the identity that God the Father revealed of himself in the Old Testament. In Isaiah, God the Father reveals himself as the first and the last, the Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. Right? We also see uh, Isaiah 48.12 and Isaiah 41.4 show this. The Lord of hosts, we said in Hebrew, is Lord of hosts, and in Greek is the Almighty, which God just described himself as. Like all of you, we can't, the, all these layers exist here. So Jesus is described this way, uh, and, and the Father are, are um, described in this way. And, and so, yeah, it's not just the Trinity. Like this is what the Trinity, our language to describe the Trinity, right? Because it's not that, that like, oh, we didn't have a Trinity until like 300 AD. It's that we did not have a common description of the nature of the Godhead until like 300 AD. And it comes from passages like this. Ah, so such profound Trinitarian stuff. Verse 18, so I'm the first and the last. I am the same as the Father, right? I am the living one, right? He is alive. He, and, and then we see later again, like I, di I died and behold, I am alive forevermore. All of those are like the same description. It is that Jesus has died. He has risen again. Um, and back in verse 5, we see that Jesus identifies himself as the source of revelation, right? He is referred to as the firstborn of the dead, right? Then verse 5, that is one of Jesus's when we talk about the authorship. And, well, who's the director of this, book, of this play? Well, Jesus, the firstborn of the dead which is a reference, which we also see Jesus described as in Colossians. Um, and, and so here, it is the testimony that he has died, he is alive despite having died, and he will live forevermore. He is the living one, the one who is ongoing living. Amen, right? So reading Revelation responsibly says this, second, the vision is a sign of hope. The one who, is, who was killed is now living, and will live forevermore. He permits the church to participate in his victory over empire and over death after they have also shared in his faithful witness that led him to the cross. So, right? Faithful witness led Jesus to the cross. He continued to remain faithful witnessing to God, which then brought him into life ever after. And then we follow that same faithful witness and we partner with him in that, in the tribulation and the work of the kingdom, which draws us to the same place. And we don't need to fear because we got the living one on our side. It's not the flames of his eyes that he, Jesus doesn't say, don't fear. I got some metal solid feet. I'm going to stomp some dead people with, right? That's not what he says. He doesn't say, you don't need to fear. I'm going to pierce them with my flame eyes. He says, you don't need to fear. I'm bigger than all of this. I already died. I'm alive. It's all good. You don't need to worry about it. Like that's what he describes. This is why we don't need to fear. Yes. Right? And so it's, it's what blows my mind, right? I said week one that, that <laughs> American church culture of the past hundred years has turned Revelation into a, a, an action thriller mm -hmm. and fear is the primary thing we associate with it mm -hmm. because fear sells things. Mm -hmm. And literally the first words that John, Jesus speaks to John when John realizes who he's talking to is, hey man, don't be afraid. Yeah, we'll throw some pictures of flames up on a teaching of Revelation and say, guys, man, burning's coming. You should be scared, right? Like we try and scare people out of hell. But Jesus' words to his church, don't be afraid, man. We don't need to be worried. Because he's got this, man. He's bigger than, he's literally bigger than anything ever in existence. And he's already died. So you, you, you might die. All right, cool. Jesus already did. And there's life on the other end. And then finally he says like, I, and I have the keys of death and Hades, mm -hmm. right? The, 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 so, so Hades is a, um, in Greek mythology, it's the place of the dead, of all the dead. However, in, in good and bad, all go to Hades. And then there's like realms of Hades. But in Christian writing, Hades has taken over in Greek. There was no other word in Greek to describe like, like hell for lack of a better term. 
Um, and Hades is the closest parallel in Greek, so they use that word. But here, it's like the keys of like eternal separation and God, like the thing that would lock you eternally separated from God, like the prison that would keep you separated, whatever that looks like, and death, which would keep you separated from God. Like Jesus has got the keys and he's unlocked the doors, man. You don't need, you are not bound in the prison. Like in, in, in Old Testament, well, okay, oh man, I don't know if I want to do this. We will. In Old Testament theology, like hell as a concept is not well defined or developed. Like the concept of hell doesn't really come about. Um, the Sheol is what's the description. It is the place where all the dead go to rest as they wait the, the day of the Lord, right? But the day of the Lord began when Jesus came. And, and, and really in like the, as the Greek world overtook the Mediterranean, um, including Israel, the concepts of hell started to develop. Other apocalyptic writings like Enoch and Barak and Esdras uh, talk more about hell as a concept. Um, I'm not trying to say that there isn't hell. I'm just saying that if all we had was the Old Testament, our view of hell would be very, 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 very different. Um, and we just need to understand that like, We have some very, very strong views of exactly what hell looks like, and they're more shaped by Dante and Milton than anything else. <laughs> Dante was, uh, he wrote, not Dante, our, our deacon, Dante who wrote, <laughs> al Gahiri Dante who wrote Dante's Inferno, um, and then John Milton who wrote Paradise Lost um, in the 14 and 1500s. But I'm, we're, not, we're moving off of that. Jesus has the keys to death. Yes, go ahead, Dave. Dave. I guess what I've heard and what I kind of agree with is on that subject, There's an element of progressive revelation mm -hmm. over time from, from God. I mean, when God created Adam, he didn't sit him down and say, hey, take a seat. Let me tell you what's going to happen. You're not going to see 99.9% of it. Yeah. Let me tell you what this story's going to be. So there's always a progressive revelation from God, and he doesn't always yeah. tell us everything all in one sitting. And then and, and David's got a great point. Like, there is progressive revelation throughout Scripture. Like, another... A lot of the New Testament theology like that, that we have about angels, about demons, about hell, about heaven. Um, so after Malachi finishes writing, we have what's called the 400 years of silence, which is a period from about 400 to 1 AD when there are no, there's no prophets, there's no books that are written during that time that are in our current Bible. There are apocryphal books. There are other writings during that time. So what happens is Israel comes back from the exile, they rebuild the temple, and they're like, okay, guys, we got to get our act together. We can't go into exile again. So you start having this robust theological development during this time. You have people pouring over the scripture, and that's where the Pharisees come up with all their laws, they, because they are searching scripture, and they, the Pharisees have a very, very strict view of the Bible. Like, they don't, they're not dismissing scripture. Like, they very much, they're legalist about it, but they very much care about the word of God. And so, during this time, as people are studying it and trying to understand it, we start getting a lot of this progressive revelation, and God is revealing things to his people when they take his word seriously in the Old Testament. And so, um, anyways... We kind of, so anyways, he has the keys of death in Hades. This ties back even to what Peter said, or what God says, Jesus says to Peter after uh, uh, Peter, the confession of Christ, Matthew chapter 16, right? Like, I will give you the keys of death in Hades and, and the gates of hell won't prevail against the church. On this rock, I will build my church, right? So we see this, this similar, right? Jesus can give Peter the keys of death in Hades. And I'm not here to talk about what that passage means, that we... I think talked about that and asked the pastor. Um, so yeah, check the Ask the Pastor videos out. We talked about it then. But the only way he can do that is because he has them. Right. Jesus has the keys because he died and rose again and is a living one. So that's why we don't need to fear. Because the end of the story is already written. Where just as our current situation, our current reality is Jesus in the midst of his churches, the end of the story is God and Jesus with the garden. And it's not, it's not so much like... Jesus in the midst of his churches. It is the church in the presence of God and Jesus in the garden city. And, you know, it'll kind of like a flip-flop. But we don't need to be afraid because Jesus is first and last. He, he was dead. Now he's not. He's got the keys of death in Hades. So what prison can hold you? Verse 19. We're going to make it through. We're keeping on this. Write, therefore, the things that you have seen, those that are and those that will take place after this. Once again, this is our second command to write down. 
So twice in this passage, Jesus has told John, write down what you see. And so what is John told to write down? Well, he's told to write down three things. Those that you have seen, those that are, and those that will take place after this. And this is, um, this is where we start getting some, some variation. Everything up to this point, every group kind of reads the same way. Uh, generally, of our, our four camps, everyone understands the things that you have seen to be the visions, right? Under, write down the visions that you've seen. Um, the things that are, uh, are generally understood uh, as a description of chapters 2 and 3, the circumstances of the churches as they are now. Um, so futurists, people who, who read the Bible, being, or read Revelation about being uh, all about the future, especially dispensational futurists, and at some point we're going to have to talk about those differences and but we'll get there. Uh, they tend to understand that the things that are refers to the whole of the church age. So the things that are are from the moment Jesus went to heaven until the rapture. Uh, so that's how dispensationalists read that. Um, historicists, those who viewed Revelation talking about the totality of church history, uh, they used to hold that. Um, but it is now instead uh, a, a uh, description of, uh, it's been adopted by dispensational futurists. And so now the real question, those that will take place after this. So preterists, those who, and this is those who uh, see all this taking place within a few decades or centuries of, of writing, uh, the things that are about to take place, um, talk about the very near future, right? The judgments, right? Um, so because that statement, the things that will take place after this, can also be translated as that which is about to take place. And so for them, all of the book of Revelation is about to take place really quick and then does take place really quick. Whereas futurists, right, those who see everything as being in the, 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 the future, um, they tend to read the things that are about to take place uh, as referring to the events from chapter 4 on. Generally, dispensational futurists see chapter 4 as the rapture. And so the things that will take place after this are after the rapture in chapter 4. So those three words, things that you see, things that are, and things that will take place are complicated. Uh, and, and there's not really a universal understanding of them. Um, so... We need to have a little bit of humility about this because trying to say, well, these chapters are the things that are and these chapters are the things that are about to take place is, is hard because parts of chapters two and three, right? The, the letters, I guess the, the prophetic messages to the seven churches, some of those, they, they describe present realities, but they also describe future events. So it can't just be what is happening now because there are, if you don't do this, this is the future judgment that awaits you. There is a futuristic portion to those chapters. Simultaneously, we can't just look at uh, future, chapters 4 through 20 as being that which is going to take place because some of it describes past events. Re Revelation chapter 12 specifically uh, is understood to talk about the birth of Jesus Christ, which happened before this was written. So it cannot be exclusively about things which will take place after this. So all I'm trying to say is when we read those three statements, what you see, things that were, and th or things that are, and things that will about to take place, we have to be open-handed and open-hearted as we read that. And we don't want to lock it in. It's these specific chapters because then we have to then we get into some complicated realities as those chapters don't neatly fit that mold, right? We can't try and take like the Bible and it's not like trying to take a square peg and fit into a round hole, right? Like we're not trying to like force the Bible into our framework. We want to approach the Bible from its framework and well, shape. When this was written, there weren't chapters either. Well, yeah, right. When this was written, there weren't so chapters we're, either. So right. we're, we're, we're doing what we do as Christians. We're putting God's word into a box. That's right. We're trying to put God's word into a box. Like chapters and verses help a lot. Chapters were added in the 6th century, so 500 years after Jesus. Uh, verses were added in the late 1600s, early 1700s. So Oxford University has been around longer than verses in the Bible. That doesn't mean that they're bad. I'm not trying to say verses in the Bible are bad. They're so helpful. But we just got to understand that, well, this verse is a complete unit. Well, because some dude in the 1600s said it was a complete unit, right? Like, 
that doesn't mean that he's wrong, but, but we just got to be cautious. Anyways. So write the things that you, that, are, or that you have seen, those that are and those that will take place after this. So a, a way we can read that is that Revelation talks about all three of those things. Revelation talks about how God has functioned in the past. It talks about how God is moving presently now in the midst of his lampstands, right? John sees Jesus right now in the present in the midst of his churches. And also we see ultimately the things that will come. Revelation talks about that too. So there is all three of those features, right? And you know, we can have it all. We can have it all. As long as we don't try and lock ourselves into human interpretations of the Bible. Let the word speak for itself. Verse 20. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So, the stars are the angels of the seven churches, and this is a complicated image. We talked about this briefly last week when we talked about the seven spirits. Um, there's kind of two ways to read this. First, uh, is that the seven angels are the seven archangels. In Jewish angelology, right? So during that 400 years of silence, uh, we start seeing a lot of writing about angels. There's almost no mention of angels in the Bible, like in the Old Testament. There's very few comparatively and compared to what the, 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 the Jewish people believed about angels by this time. Um, and there was a belief that there were seven archangels who worshiped before the throne of God. Um, so that is one of the interpretation. The seven angels is that like each church has their own guardian angel. Um, basically, that, that's the simple way of understanding it. But the word angel just means messenger. Angel is not a title, it's a word. It means messenger. We have made it title, but, but any messenger was an angelos, right? Um, and a, no, a different interpretation is that the seven angels of the churches are the leaders of the churches, or the one who is bringing a message to the church. It could be a prophet, it could be a teacher, it could be the leader of the church. Um, it could be the ones who are chosen to bring a message to the church. Um, and generally we're gonna prefer that reading uh, because as we look at the prophetic messages to the seven churches, there's times when the angel of the church of this place is, is spoken of condemningly. Like, hey man, you have failed. And I think that's specifically in Thyatira, but I, we'll get there next week. And so if it's a guardian angel, then they're not failing. But if it's a human messenger assigned to that church, then they may not be doing their job that God's called them to. But the idea being that like the leaders that God has for churches, those he has a message for the church, right, that he holds them. Like they're, like they're not outside of his, and you know, he can smash that palm if he needs to. But um, because as we'll see, the seven churches, the angels of the seven churches are those that the, the messages of the next two chapters are addressed to. If these are the literal guardian angels of these seven churches, then we do need to ask ourselves why. The Father tells Jesus to tell an angel to tell John to write a letter to send it to an angel. Like, that seems like a, the post office of heaven seems very complicated if that's how we're doing it. Like, if they're in his hand, like, and they are a spiritual being, like, why is John writing a letter to them? If they're the audience, what does Revelation matter to the church? So... We're not going to prefer for this teaching, uh, at least I'm not going to prefer, you can prefer what you want. I'm going to teach it as though the angel of the seven churches are the leader or messenger or speaker for that church. Whether we call them pastor or, or whatever title we want to give them. They are the messenger that God has assigned to that church and they're a human being. Um, so the next is the seven golden lampstands. And he says that the seven lamps are the, the seven churches, right? This is the image of the church. It parallels an image that is used in Zechariah, uh, in Zechariah chapter 4, um, where the, uh, there's a lampstand and two olive trees, and they're being fed by the olive trees. Uh, and we talk about how, like, the lampstands, I can't remember if it was the olive trees or the lampstands, or it was one lampstand with seven lamps on it. We did a teaching on Zechariah. Go back and watch that. I don't need to reteach it right now. Um, but the seven, like, th this draws an image because in Zechariah's image, it is the high priest and the governor 
who are represented by the, 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 the olive trees and the lamps. Um, and so the church here, they're a lamp. And what is the purpose of a lamp? To bear light, right? And how do lamps bear light? Well, uh, by having filled with oil. And so like the, the idea of tying a church to a lampstand is that like it tells us what our purpose is, right? To bear light. And we do that by being filled with oil. And oil being the presence of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus, in the midst of his churches, tending the, the, the Jesus, the high priest of the church, tending the lamps, right? In the Old Testament, there was the lamp with seven lamps, the lampstand with seven little, the menorah, really, right? It's, it's a lamp, a candelabra with seven lamps on it that the high priest or the priest's job was to tend and keep the fire burning. And the presence of the fire was indicative of the presence of God. And so here, Jesus is the high priest tending his church as they are filled with the Holy Spirit, the oil that keeps that, bur that lamp burning so that we can bear light to the world around us. So good. So that's what you got to be filled with the Spirit so you can bear light and bear faithful witness to Jesus and worship. And Jesus is there tending you as your high priest, keeping you filled. Wow. And as we'll see in Ephesus, maybe snuffing you out. <laughs> Yeah, I've got to see where I'm right. Um, no, no, not where I'm right. That did not come out. i got to see where I am in my notes. So, right, once again, we have, like, in this section, this robust Trinitarian view. We have the Son of Man, who is described in the same terms as the Father, as the Father describes himself in Revelation and is described in the Old Testament, tending the churches and their lamps, which are filled with the Holy Spirit, right, the oil that keeps the lamps burning, um, and all of these just are present there, and we just don't need to be afraid. This is the lens that we view all of Revelation. God is present in his churches. He is tending his churches as a priest tended the lamp in the temple uh, of, 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 of Solomon and in the tabernacle. And he's got it all. So here's a concluding thought, a couple of thoughts, because uh, I know we're, we're running out of time. So this concluding thought comes from Revelation and the End of All Things um, by Craig Coaster. So Revelation does not simply convey information, but confronts the reader with the presence of a living being. Calling God and Christ the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, corresponds to the book's literary structure. The first vision of Revelation is not one of an event, but of a person, the crucified and risen Christ, the one who could say, I was dead and see, I am alive forever and ever. The last vision of Revelation brings the readers not only to the New Jerusalem, but to the throne of God and the Lamb, so that the expected response to the book's message is, Amen, come Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. This is the framework. Everything else fits within that. And we lose sight of that. If I were to, I imagine that if I were to have asked us, like, what is, like, the, 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 the leading vision or the most important vision in Revelation, we would have, I don't know, maybe you would have said elders bowing down and casting crowns. Maybe you would have said the, the divine throne room. If you look at our, no, I'm not going to make that statement. I, I like my credentials. The vision that frames everything is Jesus and God among their churches in the midst of tribulation. Because yes. John sees Jesus with them in his churches, but also understands that he's suffering tribulation. So in the midst of tribulation, God is there tending his churches, and therefore we can endure faithfully. So like this section frames a couple of things. It frames the unity of the Godhead, it frames God's presence among the church being the initial vision, and it's the tone for the rest of the book, and it sets us up for the conclusion. So we're going to, next week, we will look at both chapters 2 and 3. It's a lot of writing, um, and we're going to look at it a little differently, mostly because we just spent seven weeks preaching on these. So if you want to look at each of the letters, we're not going to spend a ton of time talking about the specific circumstances in each of these churches. We already did that. Uh, we're going to look at the letter. The, I'm not. They're not the. They're not the letters to the seven churches. They are the prophetic messages to the seven churches in the letter of Revelation, which is a letter to seven churches. Chapters two and three are not the letters to the church. The whole thing is the letters to the church. 
But in these seven prophetic messages, we're going to look at how they are framed, like what is the order and the pattern that they follow, and why does that matter? Almost every image we just saw in the past 20 verses is going to come up again in those messages. They're going to tie us back to Jesus as the revealer of these words. And he can make these statements that we will see because he is standing in the presence, in the, in the midst of the churches, and he's doing his job of tending to the lamps. All right, that's what I got. Who's got questions? All right, you can ask me afterwards, or maybe there's some online, but next week, same time, same place, Lord willing, we're going to do chapters two and three, and then after that, it's going to get real interesting uh, in chapter four, because that's where we really start seeing a lot of variation among these views. So let's pray. God, I thank you that, man, you're here in this presence, and that you're tending like the, the lamps of the church, because I know I can't do it. Um, I thank you that like whatever it is any of us are about to face, that like you're here in our presence, keeping us filled, keeping our flame lit. Like we have our responsibility of bearing faithful witness, but like, we don't have to do that alone. The high priest is there tending to us. So God, I pray that like with that, we would have the encouragement that whatever we face, we don't need to fear because you are the living one and there is, you are the first and the last. So we commit ourselves this week to you and we pray it in your holy precious name. Amen. Amen. Go with